But what we try to do in this session is give you a little taste of a couple of important things. As, uh, oh, give me a hug. Uh, these are important things. Yeah, yeah it's an important thing. I haven't seen myself in I don't know how long. Um, one of the things that you heard a lot about today from Professor Reich was this use of the flagship framework. He gave you the, the, the framework itself, the background for it, the control knobs. So part of what this session will do is start to get your thinking around how this framework can work. For the rest of the course, you're going to go into detail into each element of the framework. You've seen these familiar faces <laughs> the each element of this framework. But what we're going to do this afternoon is pull it all into one specific topic. And this topic is not new to you, because Professor Reich mentioned it in several places in his lectures. He did talk about distribution. He did talk about the UHC cube, but it doesn't go the same for everybody. He did show you 10%, 20% of the population. So this whole issue of inequality in the use of services is there. Inequality in terms of coverage, inequality in terms of financial protection. So you'll be touching on some of that. That's sort of the heart of the session. But Another important part of it, it's going to ask you to do something that you need to do if you want to do health system, health sector reform well. It asks you to ask a specific question, and that question is why. So a big part of what we're going to do in this session, and I need to rely on you to do that, is keep asking and trying to answer the question why. You can see a lot of numbers. Grass. It's going to go through three phases. The first phase, not a good one after lunch, is the depression phase. The second phase, not also good after lunch, also not good after lunch, is going to be the anger phase. The third phase, phase is hope. We don't want to depress you and anger you too much without saying there's some hope coming your way. But for this to make sense, you need to engage. So a big part of the first part of the session, I'm going to show you some graphs. And they're going to make you depressed and angry. And I need you to deep, dig deep and try to explain why these numbers are the case. So I started working. I returned to the World Bank in 1996 after a few years out. And I started working in South Asia. I love South Asia. I worked there for seven years. South Asia is in my blood. I have both malaria and dengue from South Asia. <laughs> and so being an empirical economist, the first thing I did, I looked at the numbers. The first set of numbers I looked at, because I'm a health economist, was infant mortality rate. What's infant mortality rate? It's a probability of surviving or dying before you reach age one. And you look at the numbers in South Asia and the countries I was working on, and it looks fantastic. As they say in the United States, you can look at a glass of water that's half full, and you can say it's half full. The story is good. Each country, even Sri Lanka, infant mortality rate was decreasing in the 16 years before I started working in South Asia. It's a good story. Being an equity economist, I didn't stop there. You don't just look at national averages, because national averages hide a lot of things. So when you dig a little deeper, and something lucky happened to us, smart statisticians found ways to allow us to look at not just national averages, but averages by level of wealth. 20% poorest, 20% middle, 20% highest. So suddenly we have a ton of data that allow us to dig a little deeper underneath the national average. And the numbers were not that good. This is the half-empty part of the story. So if you look at a glass of water, you could say it's half-full, the first chart, or half-empty, this chart. This is telling me, for these same countries, if you are unlucky to be born in a poor family, the probability of dying before age one is substantially higher. What does the... 
Sorry? What is the number of infants? Infant mortality rate. So the bar is for infant mortality rate. Probability of dying out of a hunt, out of a thousand birds. And so you look at the gap between the poorest and the richest, it's quite big. And it wasn't changing that fast over time. So if you look at numbers for Bangladesh, it improved a little bit. Nepal did not. India did not. So we have a problem in South Asia. The national average looks fantastic. But when you dig deeper, you have a problem. Maybe it's just South Asia. Maybe Sub-Saharan Africa is different. We have data now for 29 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's not much better than South Asia. In blue are the infant mortality rate for the infants in the poorest 20%, and in red for the richest 20%. And there's a persistent, large, significant difference between the two. I just picked four countries. Could have picked any others? Madagascar, Benin, Niger, Kenya. Maybe it's just these two regions, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Maybe it's just these are the poorest regions in the world. Maybe other regions don't have as much of a problem. How about Latin America? It is even worse in Latin America. The gap in infant, please remember what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the probability of surviving till age one. This is not a trivial variable. This is life and death. The probability of dying before age one is much, much higher for the poorest 20% in Latin America than the wealthiest country, even for middle-income countries, Colombia, Brazil. Latin America actually has the highest level of inequality in the world across the board of anything. It's not a region that has done well for the poor. So maybe it's just three regions. Maybe it's just South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. How about East Asia? East Asia is the region of the tiger countries, the countries that grew the economy, that improved health outcomes, that did wonderfully for many, many years. Nope. Similar depressing story. Poorest families suffer from death of infants much more than wealthy. How about my part of the world? I'm from the Middle East. I'm Lebanese. Is the Middle East better? No. Nope. No. Nope. Consistently, country after country, region after region, infant mortality rate is much higher for the poorest 20%. Are you depressed yet? You should be depressed. We're going to talk about factors. I'm going to ask you to explain the factors for me. So you look at data we had. This is from some years ago. We had data from 59, or 56 countries, 2.8 billion people. So it's not a small sample. And region after region, infant mortality rate for the poor is much higher. In the blue bars, much, much higher than the red. The richest 20% in the red bar. We have a problem. This is a huge data set. This is a huge number of countries and population. If we had data from China, China did not have DHS. This is all DHS data, USAID from the data. China did not have it. China is now 1.4 billion, and their numbers are even worse in terms of inequality. They need to have 4 billion people with the same kind of a bad picture. It tells me that an infant is more then twice as likely to die before reaching age one if she's born in a poor family. It tells me that the child is more than three times as likely to suffer from severe stunting, malnutrition, if she's born in a poor family. It tells me that adolescent fertility rates is three times higher in poor families. So this was the depression part. We can now shift to anger. This is my favorite expression in the world, and nobody knows where it came from. There's actually debates on Wikipedia as to the source of this, and I don't care. But the reason I like it is because every country I've worked on, and I've worked on 58 countries, every country I've worked on claims 
that the health sector is there to help the poor. Good intentions. Every Ministry of Health public statement in every country I've been to, including this country, claims that the health sector is a redistributive sector. It's a sector that helps those that need most help. Yes, ma'am. You like depression, you want to stay there for a while. <laughs> Just one quick question. For the interpreters, how do people, is there a mic for the interpreters to hear? Ah, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. I used to run these courses, so I'm sort of sensitive to these things. Go ahead. Um, just wanted to clarify, since you have access to a lot more of this data, this is very interesting and surprising. And depressing. Um, and depressing. There you go. Uh, but in, do you know in North America and, or what, in Western Europe that the gap is, I assume it's different, much closer, but just, just for comparison's sake, would you know, have any comment? Um, unfortunately for me to be able to do these kind of comparisons, I would need demographic and health surveys. And USAID does not fund demographic health surveys for Europe or for the United States. We have a lot of data in the Euro region, which is the part of the WHO that covers Europe and Central Asia, that shows there's incredible amount of inequalities across certain socioeconomic categories. So for example, people who are Roma, which is a, a, a minority in, in large parts of Europe, have much higher infant mortality and other rates. Um, so there is considerable inequality across Europe. I am sure considerable inequality in the US. In the US, you can find data in urban uh, settings. Certain urban areas have much higher infant mortality and child mortality rate. But there is not statistical data in the same way we have for DHS. Yes. Yeah, there's a wondering whether within developing countries or the pool of developing countries that you've analyzed, whether there are countries that have uh, more similar outcomes between the richest and the poorest. Because they would serve as really good examples yeah. of, you know, there what are, kind of intervention. There, there are similar patterns, but we're going to get to that hopefully at some point. But what I wanted to show you is that this exists in almost every country. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is not unique to one or two or five or 50%. This is almost 95% of countries in terms of outcomes. Now, there are some regions which are worse than others. Latin America is by far the worst. Other regions do less well on some. Malnutrition, South Asia is the worst. Um, infant mortality, Latin America inequality is the worst. But if you want to talk about the poorest, Sub-Saharan Africa is the worst. So different regions have different challenges, and we adapt to it. And within each region, some countries do better than others. Uh, and so, yes, there's a lot of these patterns, and there's more research coming on that. All right, so the road to health is paved with good intentions. We're going to shift to anger, because if you have a situation where the poor need more help, what should we be doing in health? We should be providing more help. So, you look at the same countries, 56 low and middle income countries, and you look at the most basic, usually publicly financed health services, and what gets your blood boiling is that the bars reverse. So remember, blue was for the poorest 20%, and they were dying much more and suffering much more. Who is getting access to these services more? It's the red bar, the 20% wealthiest. And we're not talking about surgery here. We're talking about antenatal care, oral rehydration, <laughs> full immunization, treatment of ARI, treatment of fever, modern contraceptive use, attended delivery. So this health sector that always says we are a redistributive sector, bullshit. We're not doing that job. We are not the good people we think we are when it comes to inequality. I reorganized this data, the same exact data, but as an odds ratio. I wanted to see which ones are the worst. So 
So if you look at it in terms of the odds ratio, the probability of a wealthy getting over a poor service, we find that the health sector not only fails the poorest, it tends to po fail poor women more than any other group. So the largest gaps tend to be around reproductive health, attended delivery, contraceptive use. Consistently, the health sector, our claims to being the saviors, the assisters of the poor, are not really as good as we think they are. There's something called the benefit incidence analysis. Yes, sir. Have you seen other uh, like co-founders, like education? Probably We're going to talk about that. You're jumping ahead here. I love these groups, Nadine. They're, they're ahead of the game. This is part of the why part we're going to get to in a minute. Um, so the benefit incidence analysis is a lovely little simple um, instrument. It's a very crude analytical technique that tells measures what percentage of the government subsidy is captured by which group. So governments subsidize health care, either pay for it 100% or pay for a large subsidy of it. And when you look at the left panel, this is total all health spending. Another both depressing and angry picture comes out. This is just a subset of countries. This came out of a report in 2004. Armenia, Ecuador, India, Cote d'Ivoire, Madagascar, Bangladesh, Bulgaria, the wealthy capture a much bigger share of the government subsidy to health than the poor. We always give you a country that got it right, so at least you think there's hope in the world. Costa Rica is the case in here. When they analyze the benefit instance from public spending in Costa Rica, the poor captured a bigger share in the wealth. But what's even more depressing and more distressing and more anger-inducing is the panel to your right. When you take only primary care, because a lot of people have told me, primary care is pro-poor, right? It's the hospital that's not pro-poor. Primary care must be pro-poor. Not always. Armenia, Cote d'Ivoire, Madagascar, Bangladesh, Bulgaria. Even primary care, that small part of health spending that we're so proud of, does not necessarily become pro-poor. Are you angry yet? So, the question to you, and this is part of the asking why, which is part of what you need to do in this course across a variety of issues. But I'm just going to use this inequality to start a conversation, and I need you to tell me why do you think consistently we have this high inequality? Just to give you a quick sense, pregnant woman is more than three times as likely to deliver at home if she's from a poor family. Children are half as likely to receive full basic immunization if the children are from a poor family. And a woman uh, of childbearing birth is 40% less likely to practice contraception if she comes from a poor family. Poorest 20% or compared to the richest 20%. So, the floor is open. Why do we have this kind of... Did you have your hand up? Yes. And then if you can pass it to your colleague. Uh, Sorry to go back to this uh, major question whether to become angry or not. Uh, what, what you present is mostly static. There was one slide uh, where you showed comparison, but uh, I think, as, as far as I remember, with a gap of about five or six years only. So I would be interested, I mean, there have been interventions started, let's say in 1990. What about 2010? I mean, this is a, more of a gap which could represent a change. Sure. And I would be interested to see or to understand whether there are changes so far. Of so course, what we're going to do in the last part of the lecture, which we called home, is talk about examples where there has been changes. But before we go there, and I love your impatience, I want to know why you think these numbers are so systematically bad. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, two things come to my mind um, as possibilities. Uh, one is kind of where and how we access the health system, which we focus mostly on facilities. It's all about facilities. And I wonder if part of the dynamic 
that's set up when we only when we focus so much on brick and mortar facilities it's that it's self-selecting in terms of who has access to that where populations live transportation sure. network so forth so maybe that's one and then the other piece is um, um, the incentive payment system as well um, uh, I don't know very many countries that have very good um, incentives and systems where these primary care providers especially are going to go and work in the hardest areas sure. or the hardest I'm going to give so. you some examples of that at the end of this lecture but both are very legitimate points any other comments I think if you want to look at equity and income inequality and its effect on health you should go beyond the health sector so it's also these poor are the, are the same people who have uh, problems accessing education, mm -hmm. which really affects their health-seeking behavior, which really That's affects right. uh, them being able not only to access care, but to take care of themselves. There's also the income, of course, when our systems are so uh, dependent on out-of-pocket, then their income is definitely going to be a huge barrier for them to go and seek health services. So I think you should analyze it. At, uh, wider than the only the health system. Absolutely. Um, and both points are correct. There are variables beyond health systems, and you mentioned one, education. There are others. Um, and so I want you to think about both the health sector potential challenges, but also factors outside the health sector that cause this consistent challenge with the depressing part, which is health outcomes, and the anger-inducing part, which is access to services. What else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I also think stigmatization of the poor influence health-seeking behavior. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, so when the health system is sort of set up in a way that is very stigmatizing towards those folks who are poor and not giving them good quality treatment, just right, um, treatment in terms of how they are approached and that sort of behavior influences how the poor seek services and what types of services they seek, where they seek the So services. if the providers themselves don't treat the mm -hmm. patients in a, in a better way. Right, yeah. And so yeah. I think that so stigma has a lot more than that, mm -hmm. right? There's a deeper element of stigma, but you're focusing more on the access to service and how people are treated. Right, right, but I agree. Good. I think the other thing is also about social cultural practices um, because in a lot of rural communities there's a lot of social cultural practices that impact um, women's decision for example around contraception etc and sometimes it's very difficult to change those behaviors or um, norms. Very good. My last project for the bank was to do uh, work on population growth rates and fertility in, in West Africa and I was shocked to find out even in urban settings in West Africa that this uh, gender dimensions, because in East Africa you find in urban settings that inequality, that fertility rate has dropped and the male-female decision space is a little bit more aligned. In West Africa I was shocked. Uh, Mali, Benin, Chad, um, where you have this incredible gap between how many children a man wants and a woman wants and who gets to make the choice. It was just eye-opening for me. I was going to make the same point about gender disparity and barriers, but I also think that there's just a cost to accessing services, you know, whether you take the bus or, you know, however you get to the Absolutely. access point. I think that it depends on window of um, the horizon of survival. And so if it's typically an emergency service, then obviously that would be access. But if there's a longer window of survival and anticipated or perceived, then it's less prioritized. Very good. I'm just going to uh, uh, emphasize the first part. You mentioned cost, but you also mentioned not just cost in the system, but the cost to actually get to the system. But there's also something we call opportunity cost. So a poor family, if a kid gets sick, the cost is not just to get the kid to the hospital, Somebody has to not work that day. And that's a huge cost to take somebody to a facility when you're foregoing income when you live on the margin. So there are real opportunity costs plus travel costs plus everything you may have to pay under the table. The cost plays a huge role. Yes, ma'am. Nadim, I'm not sure about this, but women seem to dominate this uh, group. I've, I've just noticed it early on. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, poverty by itself, uh, it affects the ill health or it causes the ill health. So it can be one of the factors. Just being a poverty or being a poor is also a good reason just to get this ill kind of Ill, uh, the health. So, so the other poverty, living in a, in a difficult place, gives yeah. you more, you're more at risk. Yes, you are at risk. So you are in a good condition just to get the ill health. So that can be one of the, uh, the factor, and uh, the income can also be one of the case. The other thing, even uh, if you come to the policy, so the effectiveness of the country's policy, so how they are enforcing, because mostly in our uh, country context we are still using the pro-poor policy, but we should check about its effectiveness. So, so it could be, be pro-poor on paper. But is it actually being implemented the right yeah, way? Yeah, it might have limitation, yeah, sure. Thank you. Any men want to say something? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe to, co to, to increase the uh, means, uh, number of uh, respondents. Gender but not much different from Brooke, I'm sorry, you said a lot of things, but I would, I would like to bring the US case also because it was mentioned over there. Uh, the percentage of uh, or the infant mortality rate comparing black and white societies in U.S., as you may guess, is the same as uh, the poor and rich in, in developing countries. Like black uh, family have twice likely to uh, for infant mortality rate. So this shows that the root cause of it is uh, poverty, as uh, my sister said. Yeah. High income states, for example, in Maryland they have uh, less uh, infant mortality rate. And I wonder why don't we just focus on growth, growth, and growth so that it fixes everything. It's like a magic bullet. If a country is rich, if a region is rich, then we, we, we're going to have low infant mortality, like Finland or other developed countries, the, the Scandinavian, where there is a, a more equity society. So why don't we just do like that, the growth, the growth situation. Because it's so easy to grow. <laughs> um, the first paper I ever published, the first paper of my PhD thesis, was in the US on black-white mortality differentials. And I ran a regression which I gave the, the, the black population the same socioeconomic characteristics of the white population, and the gap disappeared. So socioeconomic is a huge driver. On this issue of grow a country, first it's very hard to grow an economy in a country, right? But uh, uh, one of my mentors, Phil Mosgrove, uh, he passed away, once was, was being told by an economist, he was being told, just grow the economy. It's, it's all, you just grow the economy, everything take care of it. And he had this beautiful answer, it was just wonderful. He said, oh, so when my son gets sick, I should go get a second job, because then that takes care of my son, right? And so this whole idea that's just about the economy is such a intellectually challenged idea. <laughs> there is a correlation with the economy because many other things happen when the economy grows. You get better health systems, you get more educated people, you get a whole bunch of socioeconomic variables that make a big difference. Thank you for bringing that point up. Any other comments? Any anger? Any depression? Anything you want to get off your chest? Yes, ma'am. Can you pass it along? Um, one other thing that I think, um, and people may have touched on that just a little bit, um, is the trust in the health care system itself. Okay. So like going to the hospital, and yeah. I think some people sometimes go to certain hospitals and are not treated right, and so then they don't go back. And so how do you make sure you build that trust or you adapt to the cultural sensitivities sure. of a place? Which is um, similar to what your colleague said about uh, people not feeling being, being respected. Absolutely. Yes. I'd just like to share an experience about this. Uh, in Lebanon, we had the, this area. I'm wondering that accent sounded so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had this area called Wadi Khalid, and it's in a very, very, very poor region. And analysis showed that they had higher maternal mortality than any other area in Lebanon, and they were bringing that indicator way down. And so uh, they decided the Ministry of Health uh, did uh, an initiative in that area specifically where they uh, decided to do, do a full subsidy of uh, a maternal package with all the prenatal services, including the delivery, etc., just for this area. And they got these outreach workers and w who went out and talked to these women. 
and it was a huge success, and they were able to lower the maternal mortality rates dramatically. So I, I really think that uh, helping inequities has a lot to do with customized sort of programs and facilitating access. Because sometimes even if you give them that service, if you don't do it in a way that's culturally acceptable, it, you're making no difference. Totally agree. And we're going to get to those details about elements of success, because there are successes which have been documented. I hope this was published. Yes. Fantastic. Any other comments as to the why? Okay, so let's move on. So what are the typical bottlenecks? Again, we've been running these courses for a while, and we have a, a set of these kinds of bottlenecks. You've touched on quite a few of them. Um, a lot of it is to do that uh, the poor live and work in high-risk areas. So they live in places where there's still no vector control, there are more mosquitoes, there's more uh, uh, problems with um, diseases, uh, there's not enough ventilation, so TB becomes an issue. They also work at much riskier jobs, much more dangerous jobs and they live in difficult areas. So they have an already a huge disadvantage simply by being living and, and working in jobs that typically the poor get. They also demand less and comply less when served. People get angry when I say that because you say you're blaming the victim. It's not about blaming anybody. This is just the reality of this challenge. A part of it is on the demand side. The lack of knowledge and education, somebody mentioned education earlier, is huge. The correlation between mother's education and child health is overwhelming. Hundreds of data points are existing on that and shows strong correlation. Lack of resources to pay for care, for transport, lack of free time. The poor have major disadvantages on the demand side. But the supply side fails also miserably. Location of facilities. The first comment given was about facilities. Money in health follows hospitals. Where are hospitals located? They're located in urban areas and better off urban areas as well, for the most part. Availability of critical inputs, providers, medicines, equipment, quality of care. So facilities that serve the poor seem to have worse quality in terms of availability of drugs or even training of providers. Bad treatment of providers, and we've already mentioned many of that. Mike. Can I, can I add one? Please. So I think one of the bottlenecks is um, not asking the right questions and not doing the right analysis. And so I think that the last example from Lebanon is a really nice example of being troubled by the, by the average, but trying to find out what the source of the problem was. So sometimes, indeed many times, it may be that you need to address a targeted group and a targeted program in order to deal with the problem that appears as an average. The problem is not the average. The problem is some specific problems that are restricted to either populations or regions or groups. But if you don't ask the right question and you don't do the analysis, you won't come up with the answers. And fully agree. And you're going to see in a, in a few minutes when I look at the examples of success, that's going to be item number one, the A in active. Ask. So, one last the, I, the importance here is that Looking for improving, taking the journal, the journey to universal health coverage requires dealing with specific, targeted, restricted problems, which is kind of an irony and dilemma. Yeah. So we did this data, and we spent three years screaming at the world. By 2002, Everybody was sick of us because we kept saying we're not doing the right thing in health. We're not doing the right thing in health. Then we got into real trouble because people started agreeing with us and they discovered the thing that scared us the most. 
we had no idea how to solve this case. We were the perfect advocates. We could tell you there's a problem, but we had no way of knowing how to solve it. We can theorize, but we had no evidence about what works. We could tell you what's not working. So we commissioned a number of studies with money funded from the World Bank, Gates Foundation, the governments of the Netherlands, Dutch government, and Sweden. And we commissioned a lot of evaluations. We were looking in this ocean of inequality, we were looking for some islands of success. Because our theory was, if I cannot show you that something has improved, I have no legitimacy in telling you this is a potential answer. Unless we had that story from Lebanon, I could not tell you that the targeted reproductive health system might be a solution. And so we commissioned quite a few studies, and we had a big conference in Washington 2004, and we invited very smart people who were not part of this evaluation, who were not part of the World Bank, to sit down, listen to all the presentation, to help us digest what we're finding. The chart you're going to see is done by a Brazilian epidemiologist. His name is Cesar Victora. He's been an equity epidemiologist forever, incredibly respected, incredibly smart. And what he told us right away is, you guys are focused only on one dimension of this problem. He came up with this chart, which is very hard to explain. And I thought economists were complicated. Turns out epidemiologists are worse. So what he said you're doing is you're only focused on stuff that's to the right side of this 20%. You're looking for programs that more than 20% of the benefit goes to the 20% poorest. That's what you're focused on. Great. But what about this dimension? What about covering more poor people? He said, you need to be looking for programs that go that way. Because he said, you could find wonderfully targeted examples that don't serve many people. Cesar was, as always, very smart. And it's a Brazilian who discovered that the Argentinian public feeding program <laughs> was one of those problems which was incredibly well targeted. Almost 80% of the benefit was going to the 20% poorest, but was covering less than 5% of the poor in Argentina. So, you know, nice, wonderful, but is it going to move the needle? But the great story when we saw this chart is we finally said, okay, there is hope. There are examples of success. There are examples where more than 20% of the benefit is going to the poorest 20% and where it's starting to cover more and more of the poor. This gave us hope. It also gave us data points. Because then you say, okay, can we then synthesize this and learn stuff from it? Because no two countries in the world are the same, but can we find patterns? Can we find things in which we, we can say, oh, in three or four countries, sorry about this, I forgot to turn this off, sorry about the echo. Um, more than 20% of uh, defined examples were more than one example, an element of reform or an element of change made a difference. And that's what I'm going to spend a little time on, is first looking at key success factors. I'm going to do it in two ways. One is about operational elements, which is this active acronym, and then using the flagship framework to identify specific rules of thumb, which we found repeated by more than one program, more than one country. That's how we bring you back to the flagship framework, because this is the first time you're going to see it in action to some extent, before you even go deeply into each control model. So what were the operational themes? The first one is what Michael mentioned, the A. Successful program asked the questions. Looked at the data, said, where is the inequality? Where are the people that are suffering? talked to them, can you believe it? They actually talked to poor people and said, what's the problem? Where is it? How can I make it better for you? What are the bottlenecks? Repeatedly, successful programs were not arrogant. They didn't assume answers. They had analysis, conversation. Second is customization. Somebody mentioned the C. Customization to local constraints and capacities. 
Just because something works in Mexico doesn't mean it's going to work in Argentina or it's going to work in Rwanda or it's going to work in Lebanon. Each country has its own set of constraints and limitations and capacities, so successful programs customize the theory to the local needs. Successful programs tried new ways of doing business. If you have repeated failures for 50 years, maybe it's time to try something different. Just maybe it would be worth it. Successful program improved results over time through pilots and experimentation. They didn't just try something, it didn't work in two years, they threw it out. They actually looked at the results, analyzed the results and said, it has to be more than 10 minutes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I know I'm slow, but not that slow. Yeah, yeah I, I was looking at the wrong angle. Gotcha. <laughs> sorry, you must tell me only 10 minutes. And 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Sorry about that. Improving results over time by learning pilots and experimentation, and V for verifying results. It wasn't just a design. They actually had an evaluation component. They looked at it. They learned from it. They evaluated it. Where the bottlenecks deleted, taken out. Where the results improved. So I was excited for a week when I did this. I said, oh, wow. I have this amazing acronym. It aligns to operational elements. And then it hit me. This is so generic. This is the case for every big problem you want to solve. It was not specific to health. It wasn't specific to inequality. It's a good acronym. It is the right good things to do. But this is not enough for us to learn from a health reform point of view. As we think. So we kept it on the side. And we started looking at the specific health reform elements. Not the operational elements, but what is it they actually did within the health sector. And this is where we came up with six rules of thumb, which align with the five control norms. The first two are on the financing control norm, then one on provider payment, one on organization, one on regulation, and one on persuasion. Again, you haven't studied these control norms yet, so it's going to be light touch this afternoon. You're going to be much deeper into it later on. Just want to give you a taste of it with some examples. I'm not going to overdo it, but there are some examples. Before I go there, each one of these successful programs is not perfect. Each one of these pro programs has problems as well. That's the beauty about working in the health sector. We fail in so many ways. <laughs> So thinking you're going to have a perfect answer to anything, might as well leave the sector if you believe this is the way to go through it. So yes, there will be challenges, and each one of these programs has had challenges, but we only picked ones which had sustained success. And the success here we defined, they brought inequality down. All right? So first is revenue generation, delinking payment by the poor from the use of services. I'm going to give you examples from insurance functions and from exemption policies from multiple countries, five countries. We have examples where they did some of that. It shouldn't be a genius idea here. Because what are we talking about? We're talking about eliminating the barrier, the financial barrier from people seeking care. We know the poor don't have much money. If you make them pay at the point of contact, they're less likely to go. If you eliminate that barrier, and there are different ways of doing it, you're more likely to get them to increase utilization. Second one is make the money follow the poor. Somebody mentioned earlier, it's about hospitals here, right? Money follows hospitals in health. Radical idea. Can we come up with examples where money follows people, not yeah. hospitals? Can we make the money follow poor people, not just hospitals? Politically challenging to do, as the Kyrgyz Republic discovered, but it's very successful. Provider payment. Link payment to providers to them serving the poor. Give them an incentive. Can you find ways of reforming your sector where at the end of the day, hospitals want to help the poor? Because they're going to get to be paid more. Again, not rocket science. But there are examples of this actually working in actual countries. 
organization. This is difficult to go through. I'm going to do it now. Let's close the distance between the poor and services. And distance is in quotations because it's not just physical distance. It's cultural distance, linguistic distance. So we need to think about the poor, what are the constraints they're facing, and how can we eliminate those from the way we organize services. Regulation. Amplify the voice of the poor. The poor have two huge disadvantages. They don't have market power, and they don't have political power. So any health system reform that gives them more voice is much more likely to be effective. And finally, closing the need-demand gap. I'm going to give you some, a little bit more detail on it later. It's a little tricky. Actually, I'm going to do it right now. So here's the example. We ran this huge survey in India in 1997 called Reproductive and Child Health. And somebody really smart, I don't know who it is, but I thank them every day added two questions. After you go through the immunization module, they told the enumerator, if a child that should be immunized was not immunized, ask a one-word question, open-ended. Why? We don't do open-ended questions in surveys. Certainly not surveys in India, which are a million data points. But ask them to add that. And did the same thing for Anthony Turkey. And the findings are overwhelming. I'm going to ask my Indian friends not to try to answer it, because they probably know the answer. But when I did the analysis, I looked at the number one reason in rural India why children who should be immunized are not immunized. Can you guess what the number one reason in India, rural India, in 1997, 98, those who were not immunized were not immunized. And you don't have to use the mic, tell me, and I'll repeat so the, the interpreters can interpret. Knowledge. Knowledge. Can you talk a little bit more what you mean by knowledge? Knowledge. Yeah, exactly. You don't even know the value of being immunized. So the number one answer given in rural India was what's immunization? That's a demand problem. If you don't know what it is, and you don't want it because you don't know what it is, you can spend as much money as you want putting vaccine services out there. It can happen. What's the number two answer in rural India for families not immunizing their children? Yes, ma'am. Too far? That wasn't it, but it was one of the things. That wasn't the number one answer, but that could be a good one, but it didn't want to come out. Sorry, it wasn't safe. That wasn't the second answer, although it's been said in a number of places. The second answer was, in India, at that time, immunization was delivered through auxiliary nurse midwives, who came on motorcycles, Vespas, and would set up into somebody's house and deliver. The number two answer was, we want to immunize our children, we just don't know when the a and is going to come and where she's going to set up. It's a very different answer. The number one was, what's immunization? The policy response is different. The number two answer is, we want to immunize, we just don't know when they're going to come. It's knowledge, but it's a different kind of knowledge, and the answer is different. So understanding this need-demand gap is important, because if they are not demanding it, <coughs> You need to persuade them before you get them to use the service. There's going to be a whole session on persuasion Monday, which I'm teaching. Monday. Um, we're just going to talk a lot about that later on. Any quick questions before I give you some of the examples? Before Nadine takes me out ahead of time? Yes. It's maybe a philosophic question how to define who is poor because in the countries with gray economy the difference can be blurred. Absolutely. In, in, um, 
in our world, we tend to think of poverty along two lines. Something we call absolute poverty, which is you determine a poverty line, usually based on how much money a family makes to be able to provide the basics, the most minimum basics to survival. And anybody below that is below the poverty line, anything above it is above it. And it's how much. But that's very hard to do. <laughs> and so we tend to use mostly relative poverty or relative inequality, which is the 20%, 20% or the 10%. So we look at, in the case of the DHS data, assets, and then we identify based on that who's the poorest, who's the next, who's the next. But this is academic. How do you do it in actuality? is a different animal altogether. And the best experiences come from Latin America, and I'll talk a little bit about them here, but if you really want to learn this fantastic operation work, not by health, by a group of people that will then work on social protection, that actually do all kinds of ways of identifying who's food is not food. When I was the manager for uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, I told my staff, stop trying to work with the Ministry of Health on poverty. Work with the Ministry of Labor. Work with the people who are doing this across all sectors, because they do it much better than the Ministry of Health will ever do. But it's a technical question. It's not philosophical. It's incredibly important. Because if you want to do programs targeted for the poor, you need to find a way to target the poor. You need to find a way to identify. It's a big question. Not an easy one. But there are answers. Michael. So I call him my troublemaker professor. This, this is a really important question. If you're targeting a group according to income, how do you determine income or wealth? And while Abdo spoke very positively about experiences in Latin America, um, the program in Mexico that was in health for insurance for people had a um, income level was self-defined. So you ask someone, are you poor in the you know, lower 10%, lower 20%, if they say yes, then they don't pay a premium. This is the program known as Seguro Popular. 99.5% people self-declared as poor. So. That's not the way we want you to do it. <laughs> we people, by the way, no survey will ever ask about people's income. Because people will not tell you their income. Real, Real income. <laughs> if you want to capture a sense of people's income or wealth, you do it in two ways. Either through a consumption survey, you ask people what they consume, what kind of things they have, and then you back up, figure out how much money they have. They may still lie, but much less likely to lie than income. Or you do it through assets, which is what we do with the, uh, DHS. You ask, do you own a TV, do you own a radio, do you own a motorcycle, the source of water, the, where you go for a bathroom, and you use statistical techniques to capture that. Just building on this commentary and on poverty testing and et cetera, and oversimplifying versus overcomplicating. Our experience in Lebanon, wasn't very positive in terms of identifying the poor, although we had a very complicated algorithm that included household surveys and a lot of uh, proxy indicators, including the composition of the household, etc. We tested it out by actually implementing a health project using that database that was done with the Ministry of Social Affairs, mm -hmm. in, a, in a project with the World Bank, in fact. But we found that the map that they have came up with does not align with the true poverty that we feel and see with our eyes in the country. It had so much exclusions, like people within the household who were excluded. It favored against the elderly because the algorithm took into account the bigger the household, the more likely they're poor, when we had elderly people living alone. So I'm very skeptical when it comes to these surveys as the right way to identify the poor in general. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Is, this is my profession, so I spend a lot of time on these things. I'm not going to bore you to death, but if you want, there's a huge amount of literature. Most of it is not in health. Because what health does is what Michael said, Seguro Popular tried to do in Mexico. Mexico has another program, which I'm going to talk about, 
which did not use that methodology <laughs> because it wasn't healthy for me. They used a different methodology which produced much, much tighter. But I want to leave you with something on this topic specifically. There's a whole range of techniques. None of them are perfect. The question is what our colleague from Lebanon said. You want to balance the practicality of doing something, the cost of doing it, with the likelihood of getting a reasonable fit. Every system will give you some failure. How much failure can you live with relative to the cost of doing it? And so I'm going to talk in a little while about different examples from different places which use different ways of identifying the poor. This is not the topic we're covering today. It just happens to be an important one. But there's a huge amount of literature on this if you're interested, and none of it is in health. It's in social protection, it's in labor, it's in social services. They do a far better job of this than those of us who work in health. All right. So just some examples, and I'll leave you with that. So the first one was delinking payment by the poor uh, from the use of the services. The first one is give poor people insurance, subsidized insurance, or even free insurance. Michael, did you work in Columbia? Were you part of the Columbia team? OK, so Harvard University helped um, the then president, uh, uh, Minister of Health of Columbia in 1992, 93, um, one, um, one Luis Londonio. Um, and they realized what's happening in Colombia. It's something I'm going to talk about tomorrow afternoon, by the way. They had something called social health insurance, labor-funded health insurance, mm -hmm. which means anybody who was in the formal sector, same thing for Mexico, by the way, same thing for most Latin America, Anybody in the formal sector working for government or for large companies, part of their salary is taken towards insurance. That part was used to pay for health care. Small problem with that. What happens to those who are not in the labor market? So you end up fragmenting services. Now it's good it gets more money into health, but what Londonio, the Minister of Health, wanted to do was to say, can we extend this program for those who are not in the formal sector? <laughs> and he came up with, a, with the help from Bill Shaw, I don't know who else from Harvard, it was a big group from Harvard, to design a program that had two elements. One was some cross-subsidy. So some of what the formal sector paid went to help those without in the formal sector, but the large part was pure subsidy from the government directly to buy insurance for those who are not in the formal sector. And they have an ident had an identification mechanism, proxy means testing to identify who should fall under the category of poor, using mayors and local leaders with the statistical analysis to identify who should get the subsidy. The result has been a very large increase in utilization by the poor. It has also been hated ever since. Who hates it the most? The, rich. the formal sector. Because now they have to give up some of their money to help the poor, and they're not as special as they were before. And this is a constant political fight. Governments are influenced by political decisions. I think Michael says something about that in this course. Um, Mexico came a little later, what Ma Michael mentioned, Seguro Popular, which is also a system that is meant to subsidize either fully or partially those who are not in the, that Michael mentioned some of the challenges with targeting in that. Rwanda is very different. I'm always unsure about Rwanda because this example of community-based health insurance has not worked anywhere else on earth. It has only worked in Rwanda, which is really hard to say this is a lesson we need to learn, because it doesn't seem to be working anywhere else. There have been community-based insurance all around West Africa, all around South, uh, South Asia, and they tend to fail. But in Rwanda, it worked. Is it truly voluntary? We don't know. Is it because it's coming out of, after the genocide and people needed something? I don't know, but it has worked, and it has been expanded 
and there's now subsidies to the poorest of the poor. So it has worked, it's successful, it hasn't yet been replicated. The Ethiopians tell me they're trying to replicate it. I don't know, let's wait and hope they get it right. Because if they do, then we'd have two data points. And we can say, okay, maybe this can work. Still not enough. Well, in health, two data points. Oh my God, we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next is exemptions. So, remember, we're talking here about the financial barrier. What's the financial barrier? Poor people have to pay at the facility. Why do they have to pay at the facility? Because the facilities need the money to survive. This is not some evil empire. This is facilities need to buy drugs, need to be able to fix machines. So these user fees are not just the evil creation of the World Bank or WHO or Bamako Initiative. This is real problem countries have to deal with. So some examples on targeted exemptions. Cambodia. Cambodia was another post-conflict country. Some group that are famous for humanitarian work called Doctors Without Borders at Saint Sans Frontier convinced the government of Japan to pilot something called a health equity fund. But does this health equity fund do? They pre-qualify people in villages using an NGO to say, these people in the village, based on a community NGO, are below the poverty line, are extremely poor. And they tell them, if you need to go to the hospital, come to us first, we will pay for your care. You don't have to pay. NGO. Israel does the identification of who's poor. How does the NGO get the The government of Japan. Yes, the state. Definitely. The second example is Indonesia. This was with support from the World Bank. Indonesia went through a terrible financial crisis in the early 90s, and the poverty rates just increased. Indonesia was going to be the next tiger, but then because of banking mess, Poverty increased, so the government says we need to protect the poor somehow. So they made available health cards to make health services free for targeted groups. It wasn't 100% well targeted, but more went to the poor than the non poor. But they did something incredibly smart. They said, if we exempt people from paying, the facilities will suffer. So they made up for it by allocating more budget to the facilities that serve the more poor people. So they exempted the poor, but they didn't punish the facility from not having care. So those are examples of countries that did something to address the link between payment by the poor of the use, the use of service. I'm just going to very briefly give you the others, because it's overwhelming if I do every single one. There's a book, which you'll get in your uh, pin thing at the end of the course, which summarizes all this and has chapter for each country. So there will be four or five pages for each country. You can dig deeply into it. And it references analysis that were found anywhere. Because we did not just take people's word. We only selected examples which research was done, evaluation was done, and it was published in a peer-reviewed journal. Unless this has happened, we did not talk about it. Because we wanted something that has some rigorous element of evaluation. Making money for the poor. The biggest example is something called conditional cash transfer. Have you heard of conditional cash transfer? So conditional cash transfer is a negative user fee. So you actually pay people to get their kids immunized. You pay women to get antenatal care. Mexico was the father or mother of this program. Interestingly, they wanted to test it in education and health. And they wanted to test it in, if you can put your kids in school and they stay in school, you'll be paid. If your kids get immunized and the woman gets antenatal care, you'll get nutritional supplements and you'll be paid. And they did two forms of targeting. They did a census of the whole country, identified the poorest villages, Within villages, they did um, analysis of the characteristics of households and tried to select the most poor. It wasn't politically easy to do. 
And what I find interesting when I read this stuff, everybody in Latin America said, oh, this is never going to work because programs for the poor are full programs. That's the first lie. The second lie is that pe poor people don't want to be called poor. So they will not take this. That's the exact opposite of what Michael said. When there's a benefit, all poor people have no problem saying, I poor. Rich people have no problem saying, I poor. So this whole idea that this doesn't work is, is sort of silly. What I found, the love of, two things I love about this program. It was started by a previous government. It was called Progressa. When a new government came, it was the first government change in like 70 years or some crazy number of years. Everybody assumed the new government will throw away all the other government's programs. The new government realized this is very popular, so they did something really smart. They renamed it. It became Oportunidades. Same program. So they can be sustainable if people like them. <laughs> the other thing people don't like is that it's a big welfare. So it's a big drain on government. I have no problem with that. You know how much welfare we give industrialists? Do you know how much government subsidizes water and electricity for wealthy companies? Subsidizing health care and, and education to the poor? I have no problem with that. And so yeah, it's not perfect, it's not ideal in the sense, but it helps the poor. Kyrgyz Republic, I, I've heard, I think there's some people here from Kyrgyz Republic. I know, I know. <laughs> so this is work that some of our colleagues know much better than I. Um, basically, they introduced an equalization spending per capita. If I'm correct, Hassel will, will correct me if I'm wrong. There were two cities, Bishkek and Osh, that dominated per capita allocations because the hospitals, I guess, were based there. And working with USAID, the World Bank, WHO, the government came up with a system to allocate resources on a per capita basis versus on a per hospital bed basis. And WHO has done research since then which shows that the payment out of pocket for drugs decreased drastically after that. Because now facilities outside Austria and Bishkek had money to buy drugs, so people didn't have to pay for drugs. It is not very well liked by the hospitals, because they lost a lot of money. <laughs> so every program you can put there, it will have people who hate it, because you're giving money away from one group to the other. Brazil did an amazing family health program many, many years ago, and one element of it which I loved is they started in the poorest neighborhoods. They didn't do the usual way. That's tested in a, in a comfortable place. They started in the poorest neighborhoods. All right, last one, I'll go into detail, and then I'll give you a break. Linking provider payment use to the use by the poor. Brazil, in addition to piloting it or starting it in the poorest areas, but the Brazilian government told municipalities, and this is a family health program in which the trick here is to register people. In primary care, if you register people, they're much more likely to go seek care. But the Brazilian government told the municipalities, if you register poor people, we'll give you more money. And oh my God, what a difference that made. Suddenly, health workers were seeking out poor people. They wanted to register them. By registering them, they're much more likely to seek care and you get more money. Cambodia, NGO. Another example in Cambodia, this was done with the support of the Asia Development Bank. They piloted contracting with NGOs. But they did it in an interesting way. They put in the contract of the NGO, if we're going to do a survey in two and a half years, if we see an increased utilization by the poor, we will continue your contract. If we don't, we may not continue your contract. Guess what happened? NGOs made sure they had services increases for the poor because they understood that their future income is related to their performance. The other Cambodia example, the one I mentioned, the equity fund with the government of Japan and then saint saint -Fontier. it changed the dynamic because hospitals suddenly started loving poor people. They are guaranteed payment 
If you serve a poor person in a hospital that has an equity fund, you're going to get your money. Suddenly, poor people are much more attracted to the hospitals. Before then, they were not, because they could, they may, may not be able to pay, they may not be able to pay fully, the hospital has to survive to change the incentives. All right, so I've exhausted you. I'm not going to go through the other examples. I'm just going to go to the last slide. Just give you some take-home messages. Then we'll leave a couple of minutes in case you have questions. So what we've done in this session is use this flagship framework to organize our thinking in, the case, in this case, inequalities and use of health services, about what could and could not work along the five control norms. Financing, payment, organization, regulation, and persuasion. We're going to go much deeper into each one of those in the rest of the week and a half. Uh, there's a lot of inequality in the world, but there are successes. And we need to learn from these successes. And this is part of what we try to do. Asking why is one of the most important things you can do. That's something you're going to do in this course. Ask why we have a problem. Dig deeper. Don't jump straight to answers. And finally, it's what my passion is. Fighting the poor is a worthy objective, and it starts by talking to the poor. It cannot be something you do. Yes, Michael. So I just wanted to add one more take home here, Abdul. I think it's um, in, in addition to the question of doing analysis at the beginning to understand sources of problems. I think it's really important to build in evaluation yep. in the programs so that you can know if it is actually working, right. if it is actually reaching the intended group, if they are utilizing the services, and if it is actually having an impact on the health status, the ultimate final outcomes. So this is something we'll be hearing next week on Tuesday from Octavio Gomez from Mexico because they built in rigorous evaluation into the program, into the conditional cash transfer, and also into Seguro Popular. So setting up a data collection unit and having a unit that can do analysis to know whether or not you're actually achieving your objectives. An independent important. unit of that. Yeah, reasonably independent. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we have five minutes, we can have a few questions, and then you get to break after a long first day. Um, I was wondering whether, um, in order for those mechanisms to be successful, you need a, a country to have a, a broad tax base. Because, it helps. It because helps. Rwanda was the only African country there. No, there are others, so I didn't get a chance to go through all of them. Okay. There's uh, Kenya, there's uh, a few others that actually have done good work. But yes, having a tax broad base is very important, but we can't wait for it. You know, <laughs> we'd love to have that, uh, but we cannot just wait for it. Any uh, other questions, comments? Behind me. Yes. Uh, I'm a forward leaning guy. <laughs> uh, and I just can't find any or uh, big questions. Uh, yeah, I like the idea of uh, make the, uh, the money follow the pool. But in some part of Ethiopia, uh, for example, there's very remote and mountainous areas where uh, there's high percentage of uh, children who are not getting immunized. Uh, uh, there was a design by the health officer at that place where the health officer makes the nurses, the health extension workers, as we call them, yeah. follow the pool and go far distance on foot. And these health extension workers are uh, mostly their female. And they go travel on foot, mountainous areas, insecure areas, and they follow the pool and they deliver the vaccination. And that's a great, really difficult. But I think we are missing also here that the provider side of the problem we have to consider. And most of those health extension workers who are female, they got kidney infection and others. And also they travel in a secure area. So we have to really think about them also. Absolutely. When they make uh, follow the pool, we have to also 
surround them with a good incentive and security and all the, all okay, the yeah. front line you cannot go into a war without taking care of the people on the front line absolutely any other comments or questions so we went from depression to anger did you get some hope at the end <laughs> or are you still depressed and angry a little bit? Just a little bit, okay. Hopefully it'll get better. Uh, it's lovely being with you today. I think you're going to have to take some evaluations next, the dean. Um, and then there's a group work. I think today we start to come up with. So I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, they give me the after lunch session. I don't know why. So I'll see you tomorrow after lunch.